welcome you tonight. Thanks for uh, for coming out uh, back out here at Pu'ukahea once again, and uh, looking for a, uh, a great time. Our uh, our key verse we're going to be going through Second uh, Thessalonians, and in chapter two, verse fifteen, Paul writing says, "Therefore, brethren, only pa'a is what he says. Stand fast and hold the traditions." which you were taught, whether by word or by epistle. So that's where we get our uh, our word onipa'a from. It means stand, stand fast, uh, immovable. And uh, we want to hold to the word of God so that we can do that. And we pray that our time out here will be a blessing to you as we go through God's word. It's got some, uh, a great lineup for you. We did do t-shirts this year, and uh, we'll, we'll start trying to sell those uh, after we finish tonight. But... Uh, Pastor Bill will share. Uh, we'll do another worship song. Pastor Russell, uh, Russell, you get pen. Russell Takeizu, famous for a pen that he once had. <laughs> He'll be up here to share uh, communion with us, uh, and then uh, campfire uh, at about 9:30 down there. So, looking forward to uh, a great, great evening having you guys together. Let's let's just pray for a moment before we uh, get into the Word. Father, we ask you to bless our time. We ask you to open our hearts to what your spirit would say to us tonight. We recognize that it's a hassle to get out here sometimes. And there's a lot of things that would want to prevent us from being here and being here at this time and at this moment that you might speak to our hearts. It is different when we get away. It's one thing. We love our our Sunday services. Uh, It's a different dynamic with a bunch of guys. It's a different dynamic when we get away. And we recognize you did that with your guys and you got away with them on a pretty regular basis. This is our time, Lord, and we give it to you. Less than 24 hours, but it's yours. We give it to you. We ask you to speak to our hearts, to exhort us, to comfort us, uh, to encourage us. And Lord, that we might be men of God that would stand fast living in these perilous times that we find ourselves in. But they can be exciting times for us. Lord, if we hold to the truth of your word, empowered by your spirit. So do a, a, a tremendous work in our lives over the next few hours. Lord, we commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you welcome Pastor Bill Stonebreaker. <laughs> Always a good time to uh, come out and be with you guys. Tim always puts such an incredible conference on. And I'm shamelessly going to uh, tell you about our conference, August 21st, 22nd, 23rd. It's the Pastors, Leaders, Church Workers Conference. We're doing a victory in spiritual warfare. So we got a lot of guys from the mainland coming over. So keep that in mind. I noticed that... Um, The worship team was doing some of the real old retro songs for some of you older guys. About, I think you might want to turn these mics off. Yeah, I think you're getting feedback. Um, Actually, we did, uh, you want me to use one of these and not this? Okay, you got it. Uh, We did, uh, the pastors and some of the leaders, we got together about a month ago or so, took a picture, put it on Facebook, and uh, uh, one of the the comments that somebody uh, gave to me is they saw, and I won't name which pastor it was, but they said, is that pastor so-and-so? He's really getting old. And I said, you know, you stick around long enough and you'll get that way too. I, you know, and that's true. You know, we're all getting older, but uh, we still love the Lord, don't we? Uh, I heard a story about two, uh, an elderly couple, they went into uh, into McDonald's and they bought one of those meals. I, I don't know if it was a Happy Meal or what, but they had the hamburger, the French fries and a Coke. And they said, could we have an extra cup and could we have one of those plastic knives and so they sat down, and the, the man, the old man, cut the hamburger in half. He gave half to the wife. He took the French fries, gave half the French fries to her, took the cup and poured half of his drink into her cup. And then he started eating. She wasn't eating. 
And one of the people that were in the restaurant, they, were, they looked across and they couldn't understand why, why doesn't she eat? And so after he was finishing up, they went over there and they said, you know, I couldn't help but notice that you've got, you know, you ate your meal, but she didn't eat hers. And he said, oh yeah, after I finish, she gets to use the uh, dentures and then she gets to eat. Actually, Don, Don McClure told that joke. I thought I'd just repeat it. Uh, we, we're getting some weird feedback here. I don't know what it is. Maybe. Is it my, is it this mic? But anyway, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. We want to look at the, the whole chapter 12. And you might want to turn there. And the Bible says in chapter 1, Paul and Silvanus and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brethren, as is only fitting, because your faith is greatly enlarged, and the love of each one of you toward one another grows ever greater. Therefore, we ourselves speak proudly of you among the churches of God for your perseverance and faith in the midst of all your persecution and affliction which you endure. This is plain, a plain indication of God's righteous judgment so that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which indeed you are suffering. For after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. And these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed for our testimony to you was believed. To this end also we pray for you always that our God may count you worthy of your calling and fulfill every desire for goodness and the work of faith with power in order that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we do pray for this noise to stop. But Lord, we do pray that you would just kind of overcome uh, just maybe the difficulties that we're having. But Lord, I pray that our hearts would be focused and centered on you. Lord, you're uh, you're the Lord of uh, this time that we have together, Lord. And just as we look at uh, this incredible book, Lord, that deals with so many things about your return and uh, clearing up so many false doctrines that uh, were coming into the church of Thessalonica, Lord, I pray that uh, we might be able to uh, go through uh, this encouragement in this first chapter, Lord, as you're encouraging the saints there in Thessalonica Lord, and that we might be encouraged as well in Jesus' name. Amen. Is it better just to use one of these? I, I don't know if you guys could hear the... Maybe not that one. I don't know if you guys could hear that feedback. I can, can you? Yeah, it, it'll probably distract, so maybe do something like this. Church of Thessalonica. Now, if you go back to the book of Acts in chapter 17, you find that Paul and Silas was there in Thessalonica for, th uh, for three Sabbaths. So it wasn't a very long visit, but a church was established. 
And then after the Jews got all upset and uptight about Paul preaching and and kind of messing up their uh, Judaistic doctrine of the law and so forth, they got some men from the marketplace. It says evil men, uh, but I like what the King James says. It says uh, base fellow, uh, uh, lewd fellows of the baser sort. Lewd fellows of the baser sort. You can't get much better than that, except in the Old Testament. It talks about those uh, pagans who pisseth against the wall, is how it it terms those. So King James can be very expressive at times. But what we find here is even the best churches, the best pastors, the best leaders, you can find that false doctrine creeps in to the church very dangerous. we got to watch out for that. I know that when I was a young pastor uh, that it's almost as though the roof would have to collapse and I'd have to patch up the bloody and bruises and, and bury the dead before I would act against some of these false teachers that would come in. And then, you know, then I, I eventually learned. But that was true in the church of Thessalonica. As Paul, he did lay out uh, the teachings really of the coming of the Lord. But you find that there were those that came in after him and really messed the saints up. And there was a su- supposed letter from Paul, which really was a, a false letter from Paul, that really messed them up about the day of the Lord and the fact of the, the tribulation period. And so Paul is correcting that. He's dealing with that. One of the things you find in First Thessalonians, a couple times, uh, Paul talks about them excelling still more. Excel still more. He says that twice, I think, in in, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4. But in other words, move forward in your faith. And that's what you find them doing here. Now, uh, from the time he wrote 1 Thessalonians to the time of 2 Thessalonians was probably just a couple months, maybe a few months. And they believed that uh, the uh, runner or the the mailman, back in those days, you'd have one of your friends uh, or one of the ministers that you're traveling with, take the letter back to Thessalonica. But when he took 1 Thessalonians back, they started talking about stuff that was going on in the church. And so they brought that back to Paul and said, hey, Paul, you know what? Things aren't really going well there in Thessalonica. I mean, there are people coming in there. There are false teachers coming in and really messing with the flock. And so Paul, in talking about these aberrant teachers and this false teaching, he deals with that in chapter 2 and then going on in in chapter 3. But in chapter 1, before he gets into the negative, he starts with the positive. And that's what we look at in chapter 1 and what I just read. It's really a a positive encouragement to those believers. And he will deal with the coming of the Lord and uh, the day of the Lord and uh, clear up those doctrines as we go on. But notice, I I, I noticed the fact as I was reading through the first 12 verses here, the entire chapter, you find that God is in every single verse, or Jesus Christ. Every single verse refers to God refers to God or Jesus Christ. You know, it's good when we have an attitude, a spiritual attitude of talking about the Lord, you know, whenever we're talking. You know, I know we talk a lot about surfing, we talk a lot about other things, but it's really good, I think, when the Holy Spirit is poured out upon a group of people that they just can't stop talking about God. They can't stop talking about the Lord. And that's what we find with Paul. So notice it's Paul and Silvanus. That's the Roman term. The Greek term is Silas, same name, uh, Silas or Silvanus. And Timothy to the church of Thessalonians, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he pretty much almost says the same thing in the next verse, but he uh, he gives him a, a, a a common, well, not a commendation, but a blessing. He says, grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I think it's interesting how he joins together God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ because the construction is identifying Jesus Christ as part of the Godhead. One God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Obviously, Paul is anointed by the Holy Spirit writing this, So you have the Holy Spirit writing through Paul. You have God the Father and God the Son, the Trinity. There's no other group on planet Earth that believes in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit and the Trinity and Jesus being God except Christians. 
if they don't believe in the Trinity, if they don't believe that Jesus is uh, is God come in the flesh, then it's a cult. As I was talking with some brothers uh, at, at dinner, you know, and you have a lot of that out there. But I like the fact that notice this letter, what Paul is penning, very important. Twice he talks about God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ and Paul writing through the power of the Holy Spirit. So this is big stuff. This is serious now. One of the things we think about, Lord Jesus Christ, uh, sometimes we think, well, that's his name, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, the Lord is his title. The title is Lord, just as Sarah called Abraham Lord. It's kind of his title of respect. Jesus is his name, Jehovah Shua, or God is salvation, contraction of Jehovah Shua, Jesus. That's his name, and Christ is his office, or the anointed one, the Messiah. So we find that in Paul's letter. And notice, often when he writes, he writes, grace to you and peace. Grace and peace. That's Paul's signature. And I learned when I was just a young Christian from Pastor Chuck, he said, the Siamese twins of the New Testament, grace and peace. So important because I think that grace of God, I don't know in, in my life that I've embraced the grace of God like I should. Oh, I've wanted the peace of God. But when you think of the grace of God, it's what God gives of himself. And this is the blessing to the church. What God gives of himself, grace to you, Church of Thessalonica, God's unmerited favor, God's goodness that he bestows upon you, the church, without any work, without any effort on your part. It's just there to receive. Boy, could we just meditate on that? And, and that might be good, you know, if you have some private time just to meditate on the, the grace of God. Because he starts with grace here in chapter 1, verse 2, and he ends with grace in the, in the final verse as well. So, grace. And then he talks about peace. Grace charis, that's the Greek greeting. Shalom, or peace, is the Hebrew greeting. So you have the two, the Gentile and the Jew, coming together in one in Christ Jesus. But the peace of God, that's a gift. That, that's a gift of God. And it's after, it, it's basically the, the effect that we have because we've received the grace of God. You can't have the peace of God without having the grace of God. And so when we embrace the grace of God, that peace comes. It's really a spirit of well-being no matter what is going on in our life. There's probably some pretty heavy things going on in a, in a gathering like this in your life. You've got to realize that in uh, the church of Thessalonica, there were some heavy things going on. A lot of persecution, a lot of heartache, a lot of trouble. Pliny, Pliny is a first century author, naturalist, philosopher, a friend of Caesar uh, Vespasian, and he said the first Gentile martyr took place there in Thessalonica. So th they were going through some real trials, and yet here this commendation or this blessing of peace be upon them, even in the midst of their trial and their persecution. He also, notice in verse 3 and 4, well, you know, dabble a little more in this. It says, We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brethren, as is only fitting, because your faith is greatly enlarged, and the love of each one of you toward one another grows ever greater. Therefore, we ourselves speak proudly of you among the churches of God for your perseverance and faith in the midst of all your persecution and affliction which you endure. So the evidence here of God's work in their hearts and their lives and in our heart, in our life, what is the evidence? It's right there. It's that fruit of the Spirit, love. He emphasizes love. Oh, he emphasizes faith, faith, hope, and love. The greatest of all is, is love. But if he, uh, in, uh, in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit is love, singular. And then after that, what comes after that? When you have the love of God, then peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, all that follows that. So guys, if we're, we're not excelling in love, and I have to be real honest, that is hard for me. Very hard for me. 
I know I get up and I preach and you think, oh, Bill probably doesn't have a problem with this. No, I always have. I've never known love as a kid growing up. I'm not trying to, you know, poor mouth me, but I, I just, it's difficult. I remember before I was a Christian, when I was messing around doing stuff that you shouldn't be doing, I told someone, I can't love. And although, you know, doing stuff I shouldn't do. I can't love. Why not? I don't know. I just can't love. I was too selfish. But you see, when Christ comes in, he breaks. If there's not a breaking in our heart, it's very hard to do anything but love ourselves and be self-centered and selfish. But when God breaks us and, and Christ comes in and he does that work of the Spirit, then he gives us the ability to love beyond, you know, our comfort zone. And that's hard to break through at times, loving beyond that comfort zone that we might have. But notice for them, for them, uh, they were enlarged in their faith or they were growing in faith. And how is that seen? How is that faith seen? Well, it's seen in their ever-increasing love of the brethren. The ever-increasing love. And that's the very thing in First Thessalonians. You can look on your own. I'm not going to turn to these scriptures. But you can find it in chapter 3, verse 10 and 12. That's what Paul is encouraging them in, growing in your love. And then in chapter 4, he talks about excelling still more. So Paul was praying for that. He was encouraging that. And notice they're doing that. I think sometimes we come together and we gather together and we just want to hear something we've never heard before. We just want to hear some story that will really move us emotionally. But you know what? So much of our Christianity is so basic, and it's so down to earth, and it's so pedestrian, you might say. When he says love and courage excel still more in that, then we need to do that. It's a good time, you know, as we're reaching out and we're seeing one another that sometimes we don't see, you know, except at some of these conferences is to pray to one another and just say, hey, man, I love you. You know, I'm, I'm starting to say that more in church with people. I don't know that much. Hey, I love you. It feels awkward. But they go, really? <laughs> Maybe I'll come back to this church. But I feel that, you know, I, I feel like I need to say that. So, you know, I, it, it's more about me. But you see, notice what it does, as we saw there, they're thanking, they're thanking God for this enlargement in their love and that increasing in their faith. Notice how he says that, uh, that uh, they thank God. In other words, they're bragging. They're bragging on this church to other churches. They're, they're just talking about them that supernatural work of God in their lives in a society that was prejudiced in that time. It, it was a hatred kind of society. It was a, a divisive kind of society. And so Paul is bragging on the church of Thessal Thessalonica to other churches. What a great thing. What a great thing. And like it or not, we establish a reputation. We establish a reputation of ourselves and of our church, whether it be good or whether it be bad. You're now developing a reputation in your life. So am I. The church that we belong to is developing a reputation in the community among people that come in and go. I, I used to ask the guys, I haven't asked them in a while, what do you think the temperature of the body is? How, how, what is, what is the temperature? How are people, how are people relating? How are they feeling? I want to know as the pastor, you're to know the, you know, how your flock is doing. You know, what's the temperature? Is it good? Is it bad? Is, are we excited about the Lord and about one another? You know, I, I think uh, one of the things that we find is, is when it talks about their perseverance, uh, they had perseverance. In other words, pressing on while others were giving up. And so they were bragging on that, pressing on while others giving up. The Bible says the precious possession of a man is his diligence or his endurance. 
I know you know of men, women who have given up. They've given in to the enemy. The enemy will will want to attack in different areas, but I think one of the the greatest uh, tools of the enemy is discouragement. Because maybe he can't get you with lust. Maybe he can. But you're not good looking enough for it to get you with lust. (laughs) Maybe money is not an issue to you because you're just barely scraping by. Uh, Maybe some of those things aren't, but discouragement. See, discouragement, once the enemy gets at you with discouragement, then he can open the door to every other thing that maybe you've resisted up to this this far. And so that perseverance, it's so important for us. And unfortunately, we know some who, you know, did not persevere. Now, for them, it was trials from the outside. And yes, that's true, trials and tribulation from the outside, but you know what? It also comes from the inside as well. It comes from the inside, you know. You can have issues within the church. And we're in uh, Sunday morning, we're in chapter 20 of Acts, and Paul talks about those who come in to the church and disrupt and those who rise up from your midst. I remember the first time that Chuck came to the islands, we had a potluck with him. And so I finally got him alone. There was a bunch of people there. He brought a bunch of people. We had a bunch of people. And finally, he's off to the side. He said, Chuck. And I started telling him all the trials that I was going through with the church and stuff. And Chuck just looked at me for a while and let me finish. And he said, well, Bill, people will be people. And he walked away. (laughs) I've used that more often than not. But you see, it's so important, that enduring. Notice it says in verse 5, This is plain indication of God's righteous judgment so that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which indeed you are suffering. Notice that last part of 4, the affliction which you endure. And that idea, what does it do? It makes evident. It makes evident God's divine power in you. Because you're enduring, you're being attacked, whether it's from the outside or the inside, and you're enduring that. And the Bible says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, that you may be perfect, lacking in nothing. In other words, fully matured. So that pressure is molding you and making you into a mature person of God. So it's having that work, but it's also... It's manifesting those on the outside that are persecuting you, and God's going to judge those. That's what he's getting to. You see, when we go through stuff and we endure it, it really shows the value of God's kingdom to us. You see, the value of God's kingdom is seen by what you are unwilling to endure for it. Any relationship the value of that relationship is what you are willing to endure for it. Me and my wife, we were almost divorced. Then I got saved. A year later, she got saved. But let me tell you, those years to try to untangle the mess we made, I'll tell you, think in divorce. Just get out of this. But you see, it's interesting. When you hang in there, the love relationship and the bond that you have with, you know, not just your wife or your mate, but with the body of Christ, we're, we're so easily, we, we, we cut and run so easily. And, and I've seen it in the church. People just jump around. They cut and run when, when hard times come or, or, or maybe the church is going through difficulties. And yet if they just stick in there, they would have the most enduring, loving, incredible relationships. Well, notice he goes on and he's going to talk about those that he is going to judge. Notice verse 6, and we'll go down to verse 8 and talk about it. For after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to you who are afflicted 
and to us as well, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus. So, Paul is saying that God is going to repay in kind. A person's going to reap what they sow. In fact, Revelation has an interesting, you know, the persecution and the blood that's shed there of those that, you know, don't take the mark of the beast and don't go along with that whole Antichrist system. Uh, but it talks about, uh, for they poured out the blood of the saints and the prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, they deserve it. In other words, those bloodthirsty who are killing those who are following the Lord in that time. Church is already gone, as we saw in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 and on. Uh, but uh, notice it talks about God says they deserve it. They're reaping what they sow at that time. And so there is, there is a reaping and a sowing. There is a repaying in kind. Remember Haman when he made the 90-foot gallows to hang Mordecai? And it ended up he was hung on those gallows. The Bible talks about somebody rolling a stone and it coming back on them, crushing them, digging a pit. They fall into it. That's what we're seeing here. We're relief to relief to the afflicted believers. So there will be relief there. And, and the term is a real interesting term. It's to loosen the tension of a bowstring. And I used to. My stepfather, uh, we went to a, it was a big gym, and they had these these uh, uh, hay bales set up, and you could shoot your arrows at them. And I had a 35-pound recurve. I was just a little guy. But it was kind of powerful for me as a little guy. I mean, it's nothing now. Now they have those, those uh, uh, yeah, compound bows where you can, you could be a child and pull it back, you know, and it goes a long ways. But I can remember just trying to pull this thing back, and all of a sudden I let it go, and it went up in the ceiling. And, uh, you know, but a bow, you know, you want to loosen it, and that's the idea, you know, the tension in our life. Sometimes we just need to relax. We, we need to release the bowstring, in a sense. I just got back from the mainland. And it was a good time, about a week over there, and getting together with uh, some dear friends they look at us as some dear friends, Don and Jean McClure. Uh, they're going to be over here for our conference. But uh, what a great time with them. And just talking about ministry, talking about the Lord, and, and, and just going to with Don to uh, uh, the East Anaheim uh, church that he was preaching at. The pastor was in Israel. But just what a refreshing time. It was kind of loosening the bow. I think sometimes when we're in ministry, even though things might be going good, not going so good, there's somewhat of a tension that, that you want things to go right. And so there's always that sense of, you know, I need some relief here. <laughs> I need some relief. Well, he's talking about the relief from persecution and affliction that's going on. Well, relief for those in Thessalonica, but also notice retribution to those in verse 8, to those who do not know and do not obey God. In other words, your Bible might have vengeance. It's vengeance on the sinners, those sinners who reject Jesus Christ. And by implication, they're the ones persecuting the Christians in Thessalonica. You see, God's justice demands p penalty. It demands judgment. It demands a penalty. The wages of sin is death. Now, when we look at that, that's not that difficult. We know in our Jewish, Jewish prudent system, unfortunately, some that are up on the top, they don't get justice. But those who are down here, you know, they have to pay the price and the penalty. But in God's economy, no, justice is meted out. For salvation, the wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. So the penalty was paid for us. Now, by believing in Jesus' work on the cross, we're saved. But notice this, judgment on the sinners who reject that salvation. That's what he's saying. It's so simple. 
And, and sometimes we kind of beat around the bush in telling uh, sinners that truth. And what's the timing of that? When is that going to happen? Well, he, he mentions that in verse 7, doesn't he? It says, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, when he's revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. So he's talking about the end times. Remember, he started out in 1 Thessalonians talking about the end times. Talked about the rapture in uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And so ever be with the Lord. Comfort one another with these words. So we talked about that. Then there were those that came in and said, oh, no, no, we're in the tribulation. You missed it. And so he's going to correct that, and you'll see it in the next chapter. But when he's talking here in verse 7, when Christ is revealed, the term there is apocalypsis. And that means to uncover. When Christ is uncovered, now we see through a glass dimly. We see him by faith, but then we'll see him face to face. We'll see the reality of, uh, of Christ. It's the uncovering. Remember when they uncovered the Duke Hanamoku statue down in Waikiki? Was anybody there for that? Remember what they did wrong? Anybody? Huh? Which way was he facing? The tourist. The big thing was they wanted him to face the ocean. He's Duke of the Ocean. It was funny, but, you know, they pulled the veil. And here is that statue. It's a beautiful bronze statue. But you see, that's the term apocalypsis. It's the unveiling. It's when Jesus comes back and reveals himself. And, and Jude 14 says that he comes with ten thousands of his holy ones or his saints. Could be holy angels. And notice he comes in flaming fire. Ah, fire. The Bible, John the Baptist said, Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Fire would be, what does it do? It transforms into permanency. But it also destroys what doesn't belong there. It burns up stuff that, that, you know, doesn't count. And so here, coming in flaming fire, it's really the destroying here of the Antichrist. You get, you'll get that in chapter 2. When it says in verse 8 of chapter 2, bringing to an end, talking about the Antichrist, by the appearance of his coming, coming in flaming fire with his, with his angels. The Phillips translation of that is radiance of his coming will be his, or the Antichrist, utter destruction. So it does destroy, but it also transforms into permanency. And that's the fire of God in us. We go through those fiery trials to where he changes us. It's like that gold when he when he you know boils that gold uh, uh, in the ore and then the dross skims off the dross and then eventually when you do it over and over you eventually get pure gold and they say you know that the gold is pure when it reflects the uh, uh, you know the fire guy who's the fire guy smelter there you go thank you. Every once in a while, you're getting older, you need help from the audience, you know? Keeps them engaged. What do I need to answer next for Pastor Bill? Yeah, the smelter. When he sees his face and when the Lord sees his face in us, you see, that's when the refining process, you know, is taking place and that's what's happening. Now, again, when it talks about those who do not know and do not obey, this is willful unbelief. Willful unbelief, choosing to live apart from God. You know, one of the things that I think it's interesting when, when people go, why would God, you know, send somebody to hell and say, well, why don't you believe in Jesus Christ? You know, you have sin and he died for your sins. It's called unrighteousness. Well, I don't want to. Well, the, my, my question is, why would the unrighteous expect to live with God in his righteous kingdom? Hold it, you don't want God's righteousness now. Why would you expect to live in his righteous kingdom? It makes no sense whatsoever. And so those who do not know or do not obey reject him on earth, and so they're rejected for e eternity in heaven. And that's what he talks about here, eternity, verse 9 and 10, and will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory 
of, the, of his power when he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed for our testimony to you was believed. Huh. Eternal punishment. Amazing. Greek term is onio. Now, I don't study Greek. I don't know Greek. I can barely pronounce Greek. But uh, the keyword study Bible is a great Bible. You can look these things up and you can, you know, at your fingertips have the meaning of these. And that term ionio or eternal life, it's age long life or it's endless life. He's talking about eternal punishment. And it's the same word that's used for our eternal salvation with Jesus Christ. You see, it's not annihilation. The cults believe in annihilation, that you're just going to cease to exist after you die. Oh, no, that's not true at all. You live, but you live apart from Jesus Christ. It's not annihilation, but it's separation. It's separation for all eternity. That's why the Bible says the, uh, the, uh, the worm dies now. The worm dies not, and the fire is not quenched. So in other words, that eternal punishment in outer darkness where there's weeping, wailing, gnashing of teeth. The point is, it's not like, oh, I'm in pain now. The pain will be the separation from God. I don't think there's any greater pain than to feel like you're separated from someone. I think that's, you know, some people, <laughs> they get a divorce too soon, and then they regret it. You know, my mom had five husbands. <laughs> I remember in one of her unguarded moments, after about her fourth husband, she said, Billy, and I was a teenager at this time, Billy, I should have stuck with your father. And I thought, that's interesting to come from my mom, because she doesn't, you know, she doesn't believe in the Lord at all. But I think sometimes we, you know, you could give up too soon, and, and you realize that here, for all eternity, you rejected Christ. You have eternal regrets. I don't know if you'd have eternal regrets, but I think living with regrets is a horrible thing. To live a life regretting something you should have done or you shouldn't have done. Important to get it right, especially when it comes to salvation. And notice he says, glorified in the saints. And when is that? It's at the second coming. You see, the first coming was dealt with in First Thessalonians. And I read the, the passage in First Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. I didn't really read it all. But it talks about us being caught up or snatched up. The, the term rapture comes... appearing of our great God and Savior, instead of looking for the glorious appearing that some translations have. That's emphasizing the appearing. The other is emphasizing the person, Jesus Christ, because we're going to be glorified in him when he returns. That's what he's laying out here. You see, even in, in the, uh, sometimes we think that the Lord's prayer, the Lord's prayer isn't our father, which art in heaven. That's a model prayer. But the actual Lord's Prayer, when Jesus is praying to the Father, is John chapter 17. And in John 17, there's two verses there I thought was very, very interesting for this study. In verse 20, uh, 22, Jesus is praying to the Father, and he says, And the glory which thou hast given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one. 
And so Jesus has given us his glory. And then he goes on in verse 24, Father, I desire that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am in order that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou didst love me before the foundation of the world. In other words, Jesus talking about the glory that God gave him, and Jesus gave us that glory. And in the coming of the Lord, we are going to be glorified. Christ is going to be glorified in the saints. I just can't imagine what that would be. But that would be Christ's goodness in us. I mean, sometimes we're, you know, we could do good things for the Lord, but lots of times we don't. God's glory in us, his attributes manifest in the saints. The Bible says when we see him, we will be like him. That, that's being glorified. When we see him, we'll be like him. At that point, there will be that transformation. And that scripture we see through a glass dimly, but then face to face, that's the complete sanctification. That, that's being glorified in the Lord. One of the things before I, I leave that passage, and we're just about finished here, is in verse 10, he comes to be glorified uh, uh, and to be marveled at among all who believe, for our testimony to you is believed. Now, all who believe. That's the insurance for those weak believers. There's some that struggle with their faith. There's some that struggle with the fact, how could God be glorified in me? I'm so wicked and so evil and I'm so unworthy. And yeah, we are. All of us are that. But you see, the assurance to the weak saints, it's the act of believing when he talks about those who believe, verse 10. It's in the eros tense. I'm not an English major at all. I barely know English, but I can, I can read. Uh, it's in the arrows tense, and it points back to the act of believing, which began the salvation experience and continues to the end. You see, even for the weak there. Did you believe in the beginning? Yeah, but I, I messed up so much. Yeah, but did you ask Christ to forgive? Yeah, I did, but I still don't think I'm worthy. You're not worthy. But did you believe? Yes. All the way out to the end, you will be glorified in the Lord. And then we end off here, and he gives a prayer. This is basically a prayer uh, that he gives. But if you notice, if you go through each one of those, it's talking about God, the Lord, or he referring to God. To this end, also, we pray for you always that our God may count you worthy of your calling and fulfill every desire for goodness and the work of faith with power in order that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So, worthy of the calling. Worthy of the calling. In other words, to sense the worth of salvation. That's what he's saying. We need to sense the worth of our salvation. What is that? When you think or contemplate about what Jesus did to take you from that pit, from all those things you did that <laughs> made headline news in hell. <laughs> and God brought you from that. As you contemplate and you sense the worth of salvation, then he says, live accordingly. Live it out. Live with that sense of that salvation, that worth of that salvation in doing in doing for the Lord. And what's the result there in verse 12? The result in order that the name of the Lord may be glorified in you, in you and him, according to the grace of our, our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. The results, no matter what the circumstances that we deal with, no matter what comes at us, we're a witness for Jesus Christ to bring glory to him. Amen. Let's stand, guys. One last thing I want to say. These were very young believers. Very young. They were... Paul was there for three Sabbaths. That's either two weeks or three weeks, but three Sabbaths, depending on when he got there. 
And then they believed, and then just a couple, few months later, he came back with this letter. And they were so zealous. They were so in love with the Lord, and it was increasing. The problem with getting old is you start out, you get, you're like, you're shot out of a, you know, shot out of a rocket. You know, you're just going. But then you get older, you kind of get used to everything. And everything is not quite as exciting. It's not as, as new. And it's so easy to go into a stall mode. And into that stall, stall mode, it's so easy then to go down. And remember in that apostolic church in the first century, the church of Ephesus, when uh, the Lord through uh, the book of Revelation, John wrote and had all these good deeds of the apostolic church in the first hundred years. And it listed so many good things, but then God said, I have this against you. One thing against you, that you've left your first love. Not lost it, but you've left it. We never lose the love for the Lord. We leave it. We leave it for other things. We, we, we put all these things in our life and we, we leave it. And so what does God say? He says, remember from where you have fallen. Remember at that point of departure. Where did you depart? What did you start doing in place of that loving and excelling with the Lord? Then go back there, remember that, repent, return, and do again those deeds you did in the beginning. Maybe some of us need that tonight, guys. Why don't we pray and just ask God to convict our hearts and maybe bring us into a time of meditation and, and just crying out to Him. We can't do it on our own. We can kind of hype you know, hype you up, get you all excited about this and, you know, make a commitment and, you know, write out your, your, uh, write out your, your sins and where you departed and we're going to have a fire there and then throw that paper in the fire and it goes up and then, yeah, you could do that, but we want something that's deeper, it's more, more worthy of the Holy Spirit that he would work in our hearts. Lord, we just have to say that we're sorry. <laughs> Not only sorry. Lord, but we can imagine where we just left you, didn't lose you. You never lost us. We left you. And so, Lord, we remember back at that time. And, Lord, I, I do pray, Lord, as we do have that remembrance, Lord, not just tonight, Lord, but as we go through the next number of hours, Lord, tonight, tomorrow, and going into the afternoon, that we would return return to that first love. And then we would repeat, we would do all over again what we did in the beginning. And maybe that's getting up before everyone else, getting a cup of coffee and going out there, maybe with our flashlight or under the lights here and just meditating, crying out to you, maybe even weeping before you. Father, we just, we're so sorry, but we don't want it to just be a, an emotional sorry. We want it to be something that takes root in our hearts and causes us to act upon remembering, repenting, returning and repeating. In Jesus' name, amen.